Okay, so this paper uh, is joined with Gerard Domenech Arumi, who's sitting right here in the front, and Glenn Magerman that you saw yesterday presenting another paper as well. And basically, so the title is Housing Inequality and How Fiscal Policy Shapes It, Evidence from Belgium Real Estate. And basically, we, um, what we want to do, it's a descriptive and empirical paper, and we want to understand is how inequality looks like in Belgium through the lenses of real estate data, in particular, cadaster data. And then we will show an application in which we try to understand how a fiscal policy can affect inequalities at a local level. So basically, there's not many papers that look at inequality through housing, so why do we think it's a good thing to do it? And basically, the first, um, first motivation that we think it's the response to this is like, okay, housing matters. It ma matters in general. Um, if I want to click in my hyperlinks, so, oh, okay, I ask you. <laughs> okay, so the first reason is that housing matters for many dimensions. The first one is, of course, it matters for wealth. And it's a, we, we know, like I don't need to convince many of you in this audience that it matters, but in terms of wealth, so we know that it's the main components of households, both assets and liabilities. So, like just to illustrate this point, so this figure comes from a report from the NBB that uses the, the survey, household finance and, and consumption survey. And here what you see that's like the donuts show like the share of um, house, uh, of, of housing in terms of like main residence or other real estates. So this is the green and gray areas of the donuts in terms of uh, assets on the top and uh, holdings on debts in the bottom cut by either wealth quintiles or income quintiles. So what the take up of this is very clear is that housing matters bo for both assets and liability. So it's an important component in terms of wealth. I can click in the back. Okay, so it's also important in related to like expenditures in general, right? So according to an OECD, so to the OECD, your household spends 25% of their income on housing in Belgium. So it also matters in terms of income, and these are the two main um, measurements through which we have been uh, looking at inequality in general, but housing has another third dimension that is very important, which is associated to the locality of the housing, the fact that it's not movable and also depends on other things on, uh, provided by where the housing is, and this we can think in terms of opportunities, so it gives access, it's a door to networks, giving access to networks in terms of minorities, uh, labor markets, public amenities, of course, if you are in, in the US, to schooling. So it also has this extra component. So these like, are general, a general motivation, and then another, other types of motivations are more like the practicality of real estate data itself. And the first, the first point is that the cadastral data is very homogeneous. So Gerard likes to make the joke that once you have converted footages to meters, then all cadastral data look pretty much the same, and we can all use them to like, uh, make similar analysis, but in other contexts. So in terms of comparison or like harmonization of results, these are like good data to work uh, on. Then the, the, the third bullet point is the geolocation of it. So this is very granular data and it's independent on any administrative unit. So basically from any uh, dwelling, you can like, and like value of dwellings, you can aggregate that and look at any administrative unit that you are interested and even like make cross-border comparisons of different administrative units. And finally, it allows to look at inequality like far back in time if you use, for example, the year of construction of houses that can go back until, uh, since uh, the beginning of uh, the past century, for example. So it allows to, com to compute long time series of housing inequality in this case uh, if we uh, look at certain characteristics. So we ask two questions in this paper. So the first descriptive one, okay, so what can we say in terms of inequalities in Belgium at national level, regional level, district level, municipality level, statistical level, dwelling level? So we're, I'm going to show you some maps and some numbers in terms of like all these aggregations levels in terms of inequality. So that 
provides like new measurements in inequality in a country in which actually measurements of inequality are lacking behind compared to other European countries. So in terms of a number, like housing inequality in Belgium has a Gini index of 0.25. So it's quite similar to the index, to the, to the Gini value in terms of income, suggesting that it captures like some part of income inequality as well. In terms of regional inequality, Wallonia is the most unequal region with 0.26 in terms of Gini, followed by Brussels and then Flanders. But if you go like below these levels of aggregation, I'll show you like some maps in which you like, clearly can identify some like places in which inequality is the highest. And then like what we'll do is in, in an application, we will look at how a recent uh, policy that reduced uh, registrations fees in Flanders but maintained, but these registrations were maintained constant over time uh, in the rest of the country might affect inequality using the granularity of real estate data. And so basically here what we show is that what, as uh, the fees in terms of registra the registration fees declined in Flanders, what we expect and we find in the data is that prices increase in the Flanders areas, especially like among those that were liquidity constraints. So basically like we saw a rise in housing values at the bottom of the housing value distribution and that de automatically declined inequality, but we see that this de general decline in inequality is salient in some local areas, but it's not in some other local areas. So we contribute to two strands of literature. So the, the first one is like this huge literature that looks at what, how to measure inequalities. And we think that we make three, three contributions. The first one is that we follow like the trend in the literature that has started looking at very aggregate values for inequality at the national level. And more and more we are going towards like local measures of inequality. So Celine just pointed, uh, made a, a nice claim to me that lo looking at housing was in particularly important at the local level. And so here we do it also f in terms of like looking at inequality. We, um, we, we're, we only know another paper that looks at specifically at housing inequalities, Albui and, and Zabek, it's not published yet, for the United States, so we relate to them. There's not many papers that have looked at inequality through housing. And then finally, we also contribute to like providing some estimates for any, in, in terms of inequality for Belgium, for which there are not so many. If you look at uh, the WIT database, for instance, Belgium is pretty much absent. So the second contribution is on the effects of fiscal policies uh, on housing outcomes. And most of the literature has, has focused on the implications for housing prices or home ownership. So there are not so many papers that have like looked at inequality outcomes. And basically, like we think that the paper we relate the, the most to is this last one by Damen and, and Goivet in 2021 that also looked the same data, so cadastre data in Belgium, but have looked at the impact of the one bonus uh, in Flanders. So we look at this more recent change in terms of like registration fees. So in terms of the data, so we'll, we'll use uh, the Belgian cadastre, so provided by the Federal um, uh, Institute of fin Finance, says, and that has been granted to us thanks to Peter Rosens uh, here in the bank. So thank you for that. And basically it has two main components. So the first one is a transaction data set where you observe all the, 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 the prices of the dwellings that have been sold over a certain period of time. So here we have between January 2006 until July 2022. You know for each dwelling that was sold all the characteristics, the number of rooms, the, surf the surface, the number of bathrooms, and so on. And so we focus on only on houses and, apart uh, houses and apartments that were sold. So basically, like our sample is 2 million transactions over these 16 years. Then we have like the universe of dwellings in the, in the, in the country. So also those that were not sold and therefore not in the transactions database. And uh, so we have this as of July 2022. So removing everything that is not houses and apartments, we keep a, a sample of 4.2 million dwellings. Just some summary statistics for what's in the data. So we know in, like, in the transactions database, we know the average 
price of the sale. We know then for both database, like households, the dwelling characteristics, the surface, the share of houses, we know like whether there's central heating and so on. So basically if you compare the two uh, database, the main takeaway is that the, the typical house that is being sold on the market is quite representative of what's uh, in the, the stock available. So basically it's just a little bit smaller than what's there and it's a little bit older. So you see, for example, that, uh, that in terms of like the construction, e construction year, the last renovation, or like whether there's also central heating. So the first thing that we do is that we will use this transaction uh, database to predict the value of houses for all these 4.2 million dwellings at the national level. Okay, so for that we, based on the characteristics and the price of each dwelling in our transaction data, we predict the value of all the other dwellings, training a random forest model. And like this is the outcome in terms of uh, median uh, values for the country. So this is a like map that probably you can compare quite easily to what's already there. So if you go to notaire.be, you find something similar, so like uh, which gives us confidence on the methodology we're using. So you see that some places are more yellow bright than others, meaning that they're more expensive than the rest. So like in the middle, uh, in Brussels, you have uh, Wolloué Saint Pierre uh, that stands up as the most expensive municipality. And then in, La, in like in the bottom, in the Brabant Wallon, you have Lan, which is another municipality that, jump, that jumps off, uh, on the ice. So basically, Apart from this, like the basic pattern that you that you find is like really a north-south gradient. So like it's more expensive to buy a house in Flanders than in uh, the, the south of the country, and um, and, um, and pretty much this. So now we will use these uh, housing values to like uh, show some Gini indices. Okay, in terms of housing value inequality for the year 2022. So here, like I showed you, so the average for Belgium is 0.25. So these figures show aggregates in terms of Gini housing value inequality for uh, provinces, districts, municipalities, and statistical levels. Okay, so basically what can we say when we look at these maps? So basically the more aggregates we go, the less we notice like uh, this difference, these discrepancies in inequalities. So the more local we are, the more we can see the, 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 like the differences in terms of inequality at local level, of course. So where, are, like, um, where do we see these local inequalities? Basically, in the province map, we see that uh, it's more unequal in the province of Hainaut than in the province of Lambourg. We also see high inequality in, in um, Bruxelles Capital. If you go at the statistical level map, then there we really see like yellow dots in the north of Flanders. So that's uh, in, uh, um, it's like at the right of Antwerp. No, if I'm correct, <laughs> I should revise. I had revised my geography, but. So, um, then that's for like aggregate measures of inequality. So here we're zooming in into Brussels. So like the left map shows you Gini indices in Brussels at the statistical level. And then the right map shows um, the Gini for each dwelling. So that's from a methodology that has been um, uh, um, proposed by, by Gerard in his uh, job market paper a couple of years ago. And um, basically what we're doing is, uh, yes, that one is, uh, no, back, no, oh, hold on. Uh, 
Okay. So basically, the way you construct a gene index at the dwelling level is that you select the dwelling you are interested in providing a, a gene measure for it. You construct a circle of a radius of x around it, and so based on the value of each of the dwellings around, you just construct the genie for that dwelling. So that's the procedure we, we do, and in the paper we'll provide like, the data for, uh, for, for Brussels and for the main cities in Belgium. So you can go, go back, please. And so basically that's what the figure looks like, and we see that like, okay, very local inequality at the very local level is like bright green and yellow in the south of Brussels in the region, in the, in the, like in the municipalities of Uccle, Ixel, uh, and the south of the Bruxelles, uh, what is Brussels. Um, so, so we can also show some evolutions in terms of housing value inequality. So this, this figure shows for each of the three regions plus Belgium overall in red. So red is Belgium, green is Flanders, and like the the army green is Wallonia, and the orange is, is Brussels. So you see that like there is so there's this, this this question mark of whether like Belgium is showing an increasing pattern on inequality. Well, it does uh, from the, our estimates in terms of housing inequality it seems to remain quite constant despite the decline in inequality in the crisis uh, years. So we can also, I told you that we could also go back uh, in time if we look at other characteristics in yeah, the housing. So if you press the, the other button. So uh, here we construct a measure of inequality based on the space of the dwelling. So this figure shows housing space inequality. And uh, based on the space, then we can, given the year of construction of all the dwelling, we can construct Gini, and this is based on the, the dispersion in the space of each dwelling. So that's what the figure we got. So basically, we see that overall, we see a declining pattern until the 1960s for all the regions apart from Brussels that it remains quite flat, and at the end we do see a small increase in inequality. So how does like this housing inequality compares to other measures of inequality? So here what we do is that we just correlate um, um, inequality in terms of housing to inequality in terms of income. So we want to do it at the most local level possible, so at the statistical level, uh, at the statistic, statistical sector level, we have the interquartile range that is available in StatBell. So we correlate an interquartile range based on the values of the houses to the interquartile range of uh, providing that bell. So we, we do find a very high correlation between the, the two indices, indicating that what we're capturing in terms of inequality is probably very much related to income inequality. So now, what can we say about like, how a fiscal policy affects housing inequality and how can we like, have implications at a uh, very uh, disaggregated level. So for this, we look at this uh, reduction in registration fees. So basically, they went from 6% to 3% in Flanders, and they remained constant in uh, the other regions of the country. And from like, uh, like a, a small conceptual framework in mind where house, uh, the housing supply is a very inelastic, like if you relax liquidity constraints, by reducing the entry cost to buy a house, you expect demand to, to increase and therefore prices to increase. So basically that's the hypothesis that we test in a difference in different types of, of, of methodology. Basically we regress the log of the prices on an indicator of whether a dwelling was sold before or after the implementation of the policy and whether it was sold in Flanders versus, or the rest of the country. So basically the, the beta coefficients that we, um, Sorry. That we uh, we then display here. 
captures the average effects of the policy in Flanders with respect to the rest of the country. So on average, we see that prices increase in Flanders by 3%, which um, corresponds on average to like these 10,200 uh, euros. So then we want to say something on inequality. That's in terms of prices. So we, to, to be able, we need to have a new distribution of housing prices, and in order to do that, we first run a quantile regression in which we estimate for like each quantile the average effect of the policy. We, so we run a very similar regressions uh, than, than before, but now our betas are the average effect for a given percentile. So in terms of results, like as expected, if we think that these policy relaxes li liquidity constraints for those that are the most constrained, which is those that are buying houses at the bottom of the housing distribution, then we do find that the policy really increased the housing prices for the, the, the bottom percentile. So like here at the 10th percentile, we see an average effect of the policy of 10%, of 7%. And it goes down until percentile 50, where we don't, don't find any uh, significant effect anymore. So from like this, now what we can do is that for each um, housing value in 2021, we can then predict what's the uh, effect on its prices caused by the policy from like these beta tau estimates. For, for, so for, for all the dwellings, for example, that were in the 10th percentiles, we provide a counterfactual price that it's higher by 7%. So we have a new distribution of counterfactual distribution of housing prices. And based on that, we can compute the me our measures of inequality and compare to the previous ones. So that's what these maps show. So blue or purple show like places where inequality go down and red where inequality go up. So what you see is that, yes, yeah, so on average, we see that inequality goes down, which reflects this pre previous figure. So you're increasing the value of the houses at the bottom of the distribution, and then for you expect inequality to go down. But then if you look at like more locally, like either at the dis district, you already see like this halville -Vord, uh, district showing increases in inequality, and even like at more local levels, you really see like this the fact that like in some places inequality goes down, which are mostly associated to places where you had low values to low value houses to start with, and some places that have increased their inequality. So um, I will conclude. So basically what we do is like we provide novel estimates for housing inequalities in Belgium. And the, the first takeaway of this descriptive analysis is that, okay, like but aggregation hides important local inequalities. Then we use the disaggregate, like these are like our local estimates for inequality to see, okay, how do they change from a like regional fiscal change? And so overall, yes, as expected, prices went up, inequality went down, but these also hides, if you look at it as in aggregate, this also hides local differences within the country. So in terms of like in the implications, so it's as pointed out by Celine, it's important to go local. And I, we haven't spoke about who are the winners and who are the, the, the losers, but like uh, the, I think that the, the implications are, are, are easy. So basically those that were homeowners at the low, uh, at, the, at the bottom of the house value distribution probably will, w won by seeing their, um, their house uh, increase in value, but the renters who were supposed to rent like a low valued houses are probably now paying higher costs. So thank you very much, that's all I have. Thank you. <clears throat>